All right, chapter 9, we're picking up in the midst of the sounding of the seven trumpets. Uh, remember, you've got in chapter 8 the four trumpets. Before that, you had the seven seals that were opened up, and now there's the seven trumpets. We're picking up on trumpet number 5, and these various seals being opened, various trumpets sounding is the idea of these judgments coming against the people who oppose God, who oppose His people, who are oppressing His people. Let's read now Revelation 9. Let's go 1 through 12. Revelation 9, 1 through 12. Who will get that for us? Go ahead, Charles. In the fifth age of seven, and I saw a star falling from heaven to the earth. To him were given the king of the bottomless pit. And he goes to the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth had power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green thing, or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. The shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had their hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. And they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Adadon, but in the Greek has the name of Paul. One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. Okay. So again, as we're reading this, highly symbolic language um, to describe different things. Uh, when it talks about that this fifth angel sounds, verse 1, what does he see? Star falling from heaven. Okay. A star fallen from heaven. It's not necessarily seeing one fall from heaven, but we might say a fallen star. But he sees this and he was given the key to the bottomless pit or to the abyss, if you will. Um, to whom does this have reference? Satan. How about, yes. Verse 11, the angel who, has the, who is the king over the bottomless pit his name is Abdon and Apollyon. And we'll get to those names in just a minute. But this is a reference to Satan. Remember, Jesus had said before in Luke chapter 10 that he saw Satan fallen, right? Uh, referring to Satan as an angel. Uh, when you study the Bible, Satan was an angel that rebelled against God and others were influenced to follow him, those we would know more commonly as demons, but you know, Satan and his angels, hell has been prepared for them. So this is a direct reference to Satan. And he's given that key over the bottomless pit. The idea is the abyss here. When you think of a bottomless pit, just remember symbolic language that there's no physical possibility to have a bottomless pit. A pit must have a bottom. But this is described as a bottomless pit. And what is coming out of that pit when the pit is opened up, what arises, verse 2? Smoke. Smoke. And what does that do? It 
everything. Okay, darkens everything. So what might this represent? If Satan comes down and opens up the abyss, opens up this bottomless pit, and there's dark smoke coming out, covering up the sun and all of that. Well, Stephen, what you're describing, to me anyway, is the, the nature of Satan. You know, a bottomless pit has no foundation. Mm -hmm. So Satan is not anything worth to be found. And on contrary, the Word of God teaches us that it is a sure foundation. So the other thing is smoke is toxic. And it kills. And it, 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 we avoid it at all costs. Mm -hmm. But again, it is a contrast to how Satan is completely adverse to God who, as we understand in the teaching and the Word and everything, is purity, which is safe, you know, as that is given to us. So to me, it's just describing the nature of Satan and his effect on God's creation. Yes. He, he, he is the, the darkness, if you will. Uh, you know, in the Bible, over and over again, there's light, there's dark. Light is good, dark is bad, generally speaking. Uh, the light of truth, the darkness of error. And as Ron said, this is describing the nature, the working of Satan. And he's opening up that bottomless pit and he's darkening the light. It's covering it. And then you see here in just a minute what else comes out of that bottomless pit, what else comes out of the abyss. So this, this is a realm, this... This key that he has, he has the power, he has the ability, he has authority. Now understand this authority is granted to him. It's not inherent authority. You know, we, when we talk about <clears throat> Satan working in this world, sometimes people wonder, you know, why that would happen. Well, you go back to the idea of God creating man with a free will. And man has to make a choice. Am I going to follow God or am I going to follow the devil? That's why the devil's allowed to operate. But he operates within the confines of what God has established. And so God is allowing him here to open up this pit. Uh, Andrew and then Rick. Just a question on that. In chapter 20, it mentions that the angel keeps the bottomless pit as separate from the city. Okay, we're not there yet. We have a long way to go. Say that again. In twenty, the angel of the Lord keeps the bottomless pit, throws Satan into the bottomless pit. So I was certain that's still tied into this chapter. Is that being two separate entities or not? Okay, we'll we'll get to that later in chapter twenty. Okay. Yeah, but here, very very plainly described. As the stolen far, uh, as stolen far, the fallen star, and this angel Abdon and Apollyon, which we'll talk about those in a minute, Rick. Yeah, just a quick thought. This, the power that he's given, it reminds me of the way that God gave him the power of the good. Yes. Because he, he wouldn't be able to do those things to Job without that With approval, that authority from God. So. Right. That darkness, that air being, he's allowed to do that. He's allowed to do his working. So then out of the smoke, which came out of the pit, verse 3, you have these locusts coming up on the earth. And how are these locusts described? It's something like a golden cloud, lion's teeth, and a squirrel's tail. Okay, they have this power, They're, to them it's given power, they have this power like the scorpions and things like that. Uh, when you go back through the Bible, locusts are associated with what? Okay. Consuming. Anything else? Destruction. Destruction. It, you know, one of the plagues of Egypt was locusts. You look in other places in the prophets, and they talk about a plague of locusts coming and devouring famines. famines. So this is destruction. This is suffering. That, that's simply what it's trying to convey here. So the devil's been allowed to open this up and to bring about destruction, uh, suffering, pain, and all of that. But notice that these locusts are not allowed to touch what? Which is 
green grass trees. The green stuff, right? I mean, these these are locusts. That's that's generally what they attack and destroy. But he says, don't go and attack those things, and that helps to point us to the idea this isn't a physical um, plague of locusts going through the land somewhere. It represents something else because locusts would eat stuff, right? So this is talking about something else. Uh, consequences, pain, suffering of sin. Uh, behind this would probably be the idea of the idolatry, the error that is in the Roman Empire and how that is having that impact, that effect. Um, in verse 4, who are they not to target? Anyone who has to steal a god of the Okay. You, you to go and attack the others who don't have God's seal. So the Christians are protected from this. All right, so somebody connect that for me. If there is darkness, if there is error that's going out, how are Christians protected from it? That, that's how it's described, but in practical reality, how does that happen? Stephen, I was thinking about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you know, where God is describing you know, Satan and the lawlessness, and he says, for those that do not have a love for the truth, that God would permit a strong delusion. And so it, 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 it's the thoughts that we hold in our mind, the things we hold to be true. Right, exactly. Christians who have the seal of God, we talked about that in chapter 7, they were the ones who were wholly devoted to Him. If we're wholly devoted to the Lord, we accept and believe the truth, we hold to that truth, error doesn't impact us. But those who don't love the truth, those who would rather believe the lie, they're impacted. They suffer by accepting that lie, that error, that darkness, if you will. So then... As Chris mentioned a while ago, these locusts, when, when this is described, I mean, I, it's hard to even fathom it in your mind. I'm not sure if anybody could ever put it down. I'm sure somebody's tried to put this down on paper. But this is a weird, grotesque picture that's being given here. It's, it's a locust, so think of a grasshopper-like creature. But they're like horses that are prepared for battle. So you think of a big beast. Right? When you, I think of a horse, I think of a big animal, strong animal. And here's this locust that's described like that. It has a crown of gold, has a face like man, has hair like women, teeth like lions, breastplate like iron, and wings that sound like chariots. Um, it's the idea they make a whole lot of noise. Now, I don't know if you guys remember this, some of you may, but back in... Um, at 1991 in the Gulf War, first Gulf War, I remember people trying to say, oh, the, those locust wings like chariots, that, that was the helicopters, the, the uh, helicopters we sent into the Gulf Wars. Oh, man. Okay, so that's just the latest iteration of somebody's misinterpretation. Again, this applied chiefly to the people who received the letter not to 20th or 21st century United States of America. We learn lessons, yes, but it applied to them. And this is simply the idea of this hideous, grotesque creature that has these odd features and amalgamations to it, if you will. Um, and it has these tails like a scorpion. Now, what's the idea of tails like a scorpion? It says they're, they're not to kill anyone, has a tail like a scorpion. Anybody ever been stung by a scorpion? Anybody? No? Anybody been stung by a wasp? Yeah. My understanding is that a scorpion sting and a wasp sting are not that much different. Maybe a little bit more. But the idea is most people don't die from a scorpion sting. Right? It's painful, it hurts, it may get infected, swell up, that kind of thing but it's usually not something that's fatal. It's painful, discomforting, it lasts for a little time, but then it's gone. Like a wasp thing. You know, it might bother you for a few days, maybe a week or something. Paul. 
This one's going to hurt for five months. Well, but remember, the five months is not five months. Right? <laughs> it's five months is the idea of a short period, a short definite period of time. It's, it's going to happen. It's going to be real. It's going to have an impact. But it will come to an end. And so that idea of the suffering coming out of that bottomless pit brought upon those who are not the children of God. Again, this just rings of idolatry, sin and the suffering, the pain that comes as a result of that, the decay, the corruption of the society. Nancy. Well, in, in all of this, what it makes me think about is that sin always appears to be pleasurable and enjoyable and what you want, but in fact, and you used the word consequences a little earlier, mm -hmm. in fact, the consequences are like this. Mm -hmm. It's not what you think you're going to get out of all of that. Right. Exactly. It might, it might be that way at first, but it's not going to stay that way. First, it seems great and wonderful. Seems like a crown of gold and you know beautiful women's hair, but all of a sudden it has lion's teeth on it. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. So um, now it talks about this angel or this king of them, the angel of the bottomless pit has these two names in Hebrew, Abdon, and Greek, Apollyon. I'm pretty confident y'all have footnotes and what those mean. What's Abdon? And Apollyon. Destroyer. destroyer. Destruction and destroyer. That again, as Ron mentioned a while ago, is the nature of Satan. He destroys. He doesn't build. He tears down. He attacks. He ruins. He corrupts things. Now, Notice he says in verse 12, one woe is past. There's three woes. One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. It's interesting as you read down through here, it tells you when the woe is past at the end of it. It doesn't say here's the woe. You, know, you get the trumpet that sounds, the fifth trumpet. Then it says at the end of that little scene, okay, one woe is past. Now we're going to go to trumpet number six. Trumpet number six. Let's read 13 to 21, please. Ron, you want to get that? Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen were 200 million. I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those that sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth, blue, sulfur, yellow, and heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of their works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Okay. So the voice that comes, from where does it come? Back in verse 13. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from, from the four horns of the golden altar. What did we associate that with before? when there's a response from the altar. What's at the altar? What have the saints done? Prayers. 
Prayers of the saints is send it up there. Here, here is giving a picture. Here's another response to the prayers of the saints. God's acting. God's responding to this. It's coming from the altar that is before God. Uh, verse 14. The, it says, Release the angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Um, this judgment has been held back. Now it's going to be released. And the river Euphrates, what does that ring a bell with? What, when you think of the river Euphrates, what do you think of in the Bible? Do what? Joe, did you say? Okay, okay it, it's one of the guard very early on. As you keep going, what, what was Euphrates, particularly in the time of Israel's zenith? It's a boundary. It's a great boundary, right? And, and their enemies would cross that boundary to, to come over and invade them, particularly in the north. When, when you look in the Old Testament and it talks about the northern and southern boundary, or when it talks about from the great river, the river of Euphrates, down to the river of Egypt, it's talking about northern and southern boundaries of Israel because they're bounded on the west by the Mediterranean Sea, on the east by the Sinai Desert. So it's talking about northern and southern boundaries in there. And their enemies would come and cross that river Euphrates to come and to invade them, to get to them. So this is the idea. They've been held back there. And now this great power is coming in. Um, and it talks about how that they are prepared, verse 15, for what? Do I? 200 million. Uh, verse 15? 15. Yes, sir. Prepared for the hour and day and month and year. Just the idea of God had a very specific plan, specific timing, and it was going to unfold in His timing. Right? Because He's the one that had told the angels to hold back, and now He's saying, release them, let them go. And now, this is coming. And as Paul mentioned a while ago, these 200 million. So what do you think about 200 million? Yeah, there, there's no army that's ever been around that's been 200 million. I mean, I, th I think China has a little over a million. The largest army in the world is 12. It's 12? Yeah. Well, right. That was the Okay. No standing army nowadays that size. Right, right. Stand, no standing army that would be that large. Uh, 200 million, in other words, it's overwhelming. There is absolutely no chance for anybody to resist what's about to unfold, what's about to hit them. Um, and it says that they are horsemen. And it goes on to talk about how these horses are equipped. And they have these breastplate of fiery red, high... Is it Hyacinth? Somebody who knows how to say it. Hyacinth. Hyacinth, thank you. Uh, and blue sulfur yellow. So those colors, what are those colors associated with? Royalty. Could be royalty. What about sulfur yellow? That's what you find around volcanoes a lot of times. Yeah, how does sulfur smell? Rotten egg. Like a rotten egg. Exactly. Okay, this, this, is, this is pointing out, it, this, this is associated with like the destructive nature of hell. These, these are, this is God's judgment coming against them, but this is a hellish punishment and judgment. You, you think about the sulfur, you think about in verse 18, the brimstone that came out of their mouths. Right? You associate that with Sodom and Gomorrah, right? The brimstone that came down the, and, and killing and burning. So th this is a destruction uh, of the 200 million horsemen that are coming along. It's overwhelming. 
Uh, but, okay, wait a second. These are horses, horsemen, but they have tails. Wait a second. Tails like a serpent. All right. Remember before that we talked about the Parthian soldiers? The Parthians were the strongest enemy of Rome. Rome never really did conquer them, but always troubled them on the eastern frontier of the empire. And their strength was they were excellent archers on horseback. And one of the key things they were able to do is to ride their horses away and turn around and accurately kill their enemies shooting arrows. And if you look up Parthian soldiers, very often you'll see the statues or the, or the paintings, depictions of them. They're in that position. The horse is going one way. They're turned around. They're firing behind them. It, it's called the Parthian shot or what in modern terms is the parting shot. And they would actually use that as a tactic in the military maneuvers. The enemy would think they're retreating and so they would get bold and start advancing and you know when they do that the shields <laughs> go down and things like that and they would unload on them. And this, when you think about this, okay, if that kind of army of 200 million and they have that power, that they, they're these frightening images, they, they've got this brimstone, they've got all these things, this would be conveying to Christians, this is the powerful force that will defeat Rome, that will take it down. Rome doesn't have a chance to stand against this, to, to resist this. So, it's just, again, that idea of a powerful judgment coming from God against them. But verses 20 and 21, going with question 3, what can we learn about this judgment that the rest of mankind did not repent? Anything to learn? People don't always learn from their... Uh, okay. Yeah. It's just like people going to prison. A lot of them be back in there. You know, it's it's like they, they go back. They just don't work. Mike. I think also that even with all these warnings and everything else, people are still going to be seeking their sin, and they do not want to let go of that. And uh, I think that's one thing we need to learn. Whenever God says uh, about our sins, we need to repent of them. And it's, it's because it saves us from destruction, but also from a hard life here on earth as well. And um, you know, I was thinking about this whenever um, the Black Death came about in Europe. And it literally took out a third of, the, of uh, mankind at the time. Mm -hmm. And how they must have been feeling. But yeah, that still was not what God was talking about. Right. And here we are today thinking, you know, this has to do with today, and you know, we didn't see that back just like that. But um, you know, what it meant to those Christians at, at that time is something completely different than what it does to modern. Mm -hmm. But again, to your point, what can we learn from what they would have seen out of this? And that is God is able to surgically remove good from evil, from righteousness, from unrighteousness, good from evil. And if you are following God, He's going to make sure that you are taken care of during all of this chaos that's going on. And there is nothing that is going to prevent Him from unleashing that wrath. When and where and how He wants to unleash it. Yes, in addition to that, as we know, uh, and as Mike was just saying, even when these things are self-evident, people do not learn the lessons. You know, and, and God has made it known to us that we are no longer ignorant of His desires and His will. And in verse 20, in considering the events that are contained there, those appear to be <coughs> direct defiance of, defiance of God. 
idolatry and all the things that are are directly against God. And in verse 21, it's the things they were sinning amongst themselves. You know, those are sins of man mm -hmm. in that sense. So, you know, it's all embodied together here, which God is intolerant of. And He's made that known to us. And He's declared war on those things. Do we want to be at war with God? Right. Ex exactly. Exactly right. Because you're, you're not going to win. It's just no two ways about it, Chris and Mike. I believe that uh, just as this was we're talking in the past times, this also talks for us today because if you haven't obeyed the gospel and if you haven't become a follower of Jesus Christ, become a disciple, if you haven't done what is right, been baptized, if you're continuing to live in sin, you never know when the end is coming for you the next day. When you die in your sin, you dead at that point. There is no forgiveness. That's it. It's over. Mike. Well, you know, I was just going to say that as hard as it probably was for even the Christians of the first century to kind of understand what John's trying to comprehend to them, imagine living during that time and being a pagan or whatever. You had no clue that any of this was going on. And so, you know, it's the advantage of following God's Word to know kind of what's going on ahead of you so you know which way that you ought to turn. Yeah, you, you have an advantage there. And it's very interesting that you, you note that when, when John wrote this letter, we, we read it and there are challenges with us understanding it and with all the different wild speculations and sometimes our minds can run wild with it and bring confusion, he expected when he wrote it for the people to understand it. They got it. They, they, because of their experience, their knowledge, understanding the setting, they understood what he was talking about here. And the other thing is, I just want to touch on this real quick before we jump into 10. One is, they did not repent. It means it's not the final judgment at this point. What he's talking about right here is not the final judgment that's taking place. Because there's no context in which, as Chris was saying, you the, the final judgment, all people standing before God, it's not going to be like God says, I'm going to give you one more chance. <laughs> no, the final judgment's it. You're, the sentence is going to be issued. That's, that's it. Um, and then also, that they should not worship demons. All right? False religion, let's be plain about this, false religion, is the worship and service of demons. That's it. Now, we can look at other people in our society caught up in false religion, and we can turn a blind eye to the fact of what it really is. It's evil, it's wicked, it's sinful. But the reality is they are doing the bidding of Satan. And here he's, he's bringing that out. For us, it's easy to see in idolatry. You know, I mean, they're worshiping wood and silver and gold. Well, there's some that claim to be Christian that worship wood and silver and gold. But even if they don't have those kinds of things, let's understand false religion is false religion. It is of the abyss. It's out of the pit. It's not from the light of God. It is corruption. It is sin. It is error. All right, let's jump to chapter 10 now. Chapter 10. Now, chapter 10 is another one of these interludes, if you will. Remember that you have the six trumpets that have sounded, and now you've got this sort of pause before the seventh trumpet sounds. It's like in chapter 7, you know, the six seals have been opened, and then there was this pause before the seventh seal opened. It's sort of like, here's some other information to get before we get to that last thing. And that's what chapter 10 really is. So let's read chapter 10, uh, 1 through 7 to begin with. Who will get that for us? Revelation 10, 1 through 7. Mike. I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book which was open. 
He placed his right foot on the sea and his left on the land. And he cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder thundered their voices. When the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it, and the earth and the things in it, and the sea and the things in it, that there will be delay no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished, and he preached to his servants the prophets. Okay. So you've got this angel with the little book that he's talking about here. The angel, it says, is coming down from heaven, cloud and rainbow, his face shone like the sun, his feet like pillars of fire. Um, that's pointing to the idea that he has this divine authority. And remember when Moses came down from the mountain, how did he appear to the people? He put a glove. Yeah, he was glowing. His face was shining. He had to put a veil on it even. Here it's, it's drawing some of that Old Testament imagery. This is God. This is God's message. He has the authority of heaven. And He's coming with judgment. Pillars of fire. Uh, there's going to be mercy in there. There's a rainbow. So you, you've got all that imagery being given there. And this little book, what condition is it in? Verse 2. It's open. So what does that mean? It's noble. It's what? Noble. Okay, it would be noble. Noble. But, oh, noble. I'm no, sorry. Noble. <laughs> no, no. Yes, it, it's open. It, it's open for people to read and to see and to know and for it to be declared and all of that. Remember before the scroll that was sealed with the seven seals, it was closed up. There was this plan that God had that man didn't know, man didn't understand, but it's being opened and it's being revealed. Right here, this book is open. It's, it's being declared. It's being revealed. Its contents are known, as Rick said. And his right foot is on the sea, his left foot's on the land. What, what do you get out of that? Control over both. I'm sorry? Control over Okay, okay. There, there's authority over both, maybe. Uh, really big. Imagine seeing an angel standing on land and on sea. That, that's massive, but the idea is this, this message covers all. Covers the whole world, if you will. Land and sea. But then John hears something. What does he hear? Okay? Loud voice? Okay. He hears the seven thunders. What's seven associated with? Perfect. Complete. Perfect. It's a divine number. Right? Four is an earthly number. Six is a number that would be associated with man. Things like that. So, you, you've got this divine number of completeness. There is this message. There is this utterance that comes... And John's about to write it down, but what's he told? Do not write that. Don't do it. Don't do it. Okay. Very simply put, I'm going to accelerate a little because I really have to get through 11. I know this is going to be lightning fast. Okay. But God is doing some things. What this is indicating to us, God's doing some things that we can see and understand. And he's doing some things we can't see and understand. In fact, we shouldn't see some of these things. Because we can't handle them. We can't not only comprehend them, but we can't handle. If we knew what the future held, you know, some people think, well, that would be just great, wonderful. No, there's some things you do not want to see coming. It would paralyze you. So... These are things that God is talking about that He's doing that He says, no, nope, not going to reveal that. But here's some other things that I am revealing. And the angel took an oath in, before the Lord. Absolute truth is the idea. 
There's no delay in what is unfolding. And he says the mystery of God is finished. His, his plan is out there. It's, he's revealing it. It's going. It's, it's a finished thing. So he declared, as he declared to his servants, the prophets. So they're out there making this message known to the world. All right, chapter 10, verses 8 through 11. Let's read this, please. 8 through 11. Who will get that? Elijah. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take a little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it, eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Okay. So this, as with other places, it, it reflects off or it echoes what we find in other Old Testament prophets, prophets and passages in apocalyptic literature. But he, the angel has this little book and John's told that he needs to eat it. And he eats it. It's sweet in the mouth but bitter in the stomach. What, what's that indicating? Well, it's sweet to those that have or a day of the gospel and it's sour to those that judgment will be. There, we know that judgment is coming for those that are unbelievers. Okay. I would dare say every one of us here have experienced this exact thing. When we have known the Word of God, it is sweet, it is precious, we love it, we rejoice in it, but then we try to share it with family. And they reject it. And we know what that means for their soul. There's bitterness there. John's, this is the message of God. This is sweet. This is wonderful. This is great. But then, as Todd said, what it's going to mean for all these people who are not faithful to God. The judgment, the pain, the suffering that is coming down upon them. That's hard. So, he consumes this book. He knows it, if you will, inside and out. And he's to go and declare it to the world. Prophesy again to many peoples, nations, tongues, kings. So get, get that message out. Alright, anything before we jump to chapter 11? Alright, 11, 1 through 6, read with me. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven, so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. So he's first told to go and to measure the temple, the altar, those who worship there. What's the idea of this measuring out? He's indicating the, the, this is God's standard that He's using and He's measuring out God's people. The, the word here in the original, when it talks about this temple of God, it's a reference to the Holy of Holies, where God dwells with His people, right? That's where God manifests His presence among the Jews. And how does God, where does God dwell in New Testament times? 
in the hearts of men and particularly Christians he dwells in the church that's where he has fellowship with his people right um, now he's leaving out the Gentiles these sinners they're they're cut out they're they're not allowed to be a part and it says that it's been given over to them they tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months uh, so there is a particular period how long is 42 months by the way because it keeps coming up three and a half years 1260 days so the these we we see these things continue to come up this period of this this trial this suffering if you will it's a short period um, but it's a definite period again of suffering and pain now these two witnesses they prophesy they go out during this period of time and it says that they are like these two olive trees and two lampstands olive trees and lampstands being associated together they would use olive lamps or olive oil fueled lamps or lampstands if you will it's the idea they're upholding the light but as they're going out what's coming out of their mouth fire what's that doing okay when you go back and you read in the New Testament you see the preaching of the apostles and prophets Christians going out what are they doing when they're preaching to the enemies of God they're breathing out fire right Paul puts it in a different illustration the aroma of life or the aroma of death it's the same aroma right here talking about going into the world this this fire proceeds out of the mouth and it devours our enemies anyone wants to harm them he must be killed in this manner it's just the idea there's a period of time here where the gospel's going out and these two witnesses are having success in, in making advances in getting this message out they have power to shut the heavens so that the rain falls no rain falls in the days of their prophecy think about elijah they have powers over the water, turn to the blood. Think about Moses. He's just saying that these are representatives of God having His message, carrying His message out into the world. I've got maybe two minutes left. Um, it's a real challenge here. Alright, question number five. Let's just jump to that. What is the fate of the two witnesses and how do the people of the world react? They're killed. They're killed and the world celebrates their death. They turn it into a holiday. World celebrates, yeah. We, we got rid of these two that are causing us so many problems. We're done with them. And where do they leave their bodies? In the streets. In the streets. Why do they do that? Joe, do you have something? Why why do they leave their bodies in the streets? So that everyone sees their destruction. Everyone sees that. And there, there's a level of contempt there that they have for them. So think about the messengers of God going out, people hating them, killing them, showing contempt. But then what happens? Question number six. What can we learn from the final fate of the two witnesses? God resurrects them and calls them up to heaven out of the reach of their enemies okay I know this is very high level right here just sort of skipping through this but you have a representation of those who witness for God remember Martha two or three witnesses every word is established so two go out they declare this the enemies of God are being judged by the words of their mouth if you will they hate that they despise them they attack them they kill them they destroy them they think we're done. We've won the victory. We got rid of these guys. But then they're resurrected. They have life again, if you will, and God takes them to protect them. He takes care of his own Job. I just want to understand they said that on, on the Sabbath, it says that when they had finished the testimony of the beast that ascended out of almost a bit, he makes war against them and overcome them and kill them. But 
going back to what he said earlier, if an angel opened a pit and a beast descended out of it, which was the king of their uh, like little group was, if that was the devil, then how did the beast that ascended out of the bottom of this pit, how was he given the key? You know what I'm trying to say? How was the, how was, uh, well, we're not associating the beast with the king. Well, I, I, I don't associate those two as being the, necessarily the same. The beast and the king, the angel. The one with this, I would not say this beast here is the one who has the key to the bottomless pit. It just says the beast that comes out of the bottomless pit. Right? But the overall message is the idea that they are found to be the enemies of God's people, they attack them, they destroy them, but then God resurrects them. And some have seen in this the idea of the apostles and prophets going out and proclaiming the word of God. They're persecuted heavily and they're eventually all killed off, right? But what happened with the word of God? It prevailed. So in that sense, in that sense, their work their power, their effectiveness is resurrected and continues on and it can't be touched now by the enemies of God. They can't get rid of it. Right? And, and, and actually, uh, Stephen, to, yep. to your point, actually, you're right. You made right because it says um, they had a king over them his angel of all these kids. Which, yeah, and we're, we're going to work through all of this and, and we're just going to have to pick up, um, actually, we'll probably pick up about verse 15 next week in chapter 11. But we want to we want to try to, in the next lesson, we're going to try to clarify, when you read through the book of Revelation, there, between essentially 4 through 11 and 12 and following, there's some things that you start looking at and then you it, if you try to put it as a linear progression of things it can get confusing but if you see it as another approach it helps to clarify what you've read that there aren't contradictions or things like that but it's just another telling of it from a different angle with more details or different details if you will so Lord willing we're going to go through that Thank you for your patience very much. Time is up. Lord willing, press on next week.